Our next presenter is Jan Grabowski from the Department of History at the University of Ottawa. Jan Grabowski is an internationally renowned historian of the Holocaust, whose research on destruction of the Polish Jewish community and on relations between Jews and Poles under the occupation have made crucial contributions to our understanding of the Shoah. His award-winning studies had a significant impact on the transformation of our perception of the bystander phenomenon or the attitudes of mainstream societies towards the German policies of extermination. My work, research and teaching deals primarily with the issue of the Holocaust, to be more specific with the history of the uh, Holocaust in Poland on the occupied Polish territories. Um, the Polish Jews before the war were the largest Jewish community in Europe, 3.3 million strong. Under the occupation, the Germans developed a system of terror targeting the Polish Jews early on, starting in 1939. Close to 300,000 Polish Jews chose to flee to the Soviet Union, and out of the three a million Polish Jews who at some point uh, found themselves under the uh, Nazi boot around 30,000 or only 1%, 1% survived. Um, on the German territory, uh, Jews were early on were branded, having to wear wa white armbands with stars of David. Severe restrictions were placed on their mobility. They couldn't use trams, trains. They couldn't leave their places of residence. They were barred from a variety of professions, their bank accounts were frozen, their pensions garnished, and their personal valuables registered for future confiscation and seizure. Curfews were introduced uh, uh, around the country, and food quotas were totally inadequate, uh, and uh, the distribution of so-called Jewish ration cards was the beginning of hunger and later mass starvation. Finally, the Germans established across uh, occupied Poland hundreds of uh, ghettos. Um, the process started already in 1939, it accelerated through the 1940, and finally on uh, November 15, 1940, uh, the largest uh, ghetto uh, in the world, the Warsaw Ghetto, has been closed. It has been nearly exactly now 80 years ago. A city of nearly half a million people, slaves, grew in the middle of the former capital of Poland. 90,000 of them would starve to death before the ghetto uh, would be liquid liquidated by the Germans in the summer of 1942. Uh, most of the ghettos uh, established by the Germans on Polish soil were, however, very different from the Warsaw Ghetto. There were no walls. These were so-called open ghetto. Uh, open ghettos. One could cross easily from the ghetto side to the so-called Jewish, uh, to the so-called Aryan side. If the survival on the other side, um, uh, it was the survival on the other side that made the uh, flight so problematic, so deadly difficult. Uh, the Jews were being terrorized, starved to death, and worked to death in labor, slave labor battalions and work camps for Jews. In the end of 1941, and in the beginning of 1942, uh, the Germans started the implementation of the so-called final solution of the Jewish question or the extermination of European Jewry. In Poland, it meant, above all, the liquidation of the ghetto. Important to mention that all the extermination sites, Treblinka, Bełżec, Majdanek, Auschwitz, Sobibor, all of them were located on Polish territory, close to the largest concentrations of Jewish population, far from the eyes of the Western public opinion and close to the railway tracks. Unlike in Western Europe, here Holocaust was a public horrifying spectacle of death, one which involved millions of local people, forcing them to confront some of the most difficult choices a human being can face. It is the attitudes of the local Polish or non-Jewish populations which will, in many cases, determine the fate of the Jews in these areas, in these stages of the Holocaust. This is precisely what is at the core of my research, and this is what has been rarely or never reported before. How did the local populations react to the ongoing German policies of extermination? German system of hunt for the Jews, which included the German policemen, gendarmerie, rural areas, Schutzpolizei in the cities, 
It was very efficient. However, was it that efficient? The extent to which the German genocidal plan has been open to non-German, in this case to Polish actors. There was the Polish Blue Police, organized by the Germans, but composed of pre-war Polish career officers, police officers, who, as I show in my work, had an agency who pursued the anti-Jewish policies on their own, who often killed the Jews without informing the Germans. The Blue Police became, with time, one of the most deadly agents in the hunt for the Jewish survivors. There were thousands of Polish youth organized by the Germans in the so-called Baudienst, or construction service, who also took part in uh, bloody liquidation actions, together with voluntary firefighters, firefighting brigades, and finally, the uncounted crowds of people, neighbors, who took part in the liquidations of the ghettos propelled by greed, anti-Semitism or fear, entire towns, blocks of cities were now ripe for the taking after the deportation of the Jews. Movables were within the re easy reach. The Germans gave a green light, Jews had no more right to live, and the Jewish property was there for the taking. Once the ghettos had been liquidated, very many people joined in the hunt for the Jewish survivors. In the light of all the above, can we still talk of Hilberg's triad, a category proposed by the American historian Raoul Hilberg, known as the founder of the Holocaust studies, who suggested that the, very, that the human scenery of the Holocaust uh, can be divided into three groups, perpetrators, victims, and bystanders. Can we really talk still of bystanders? Could people in Eastern Europe stand by while their Jewish neighbors were murdered by the millions right in front of their eyes? Close to 90% of Polish Jews have been murdered in the extermination camps and during the bloody liquidation actions. But were the Germans and their Ukrainian helpers able to perform these horrible crimes without some level of local complicity? Was, what was the fate of the 10% of Jews who have fled the liquidation actions and tried to survive among the Poles on the Aryan side? Once the Jews fled the ghettos, they became largely invisible from the perspective of Germans. In order to detect them, one needed cultural codes which the Germans simply did not possess. Many of the Polish Jews were poorly assimilated. They spoke the language with an accent. Their knowledge of Catholic rituals was close to nil. They had little knowledge of Polish vestimentary and eating habits, and many other features which the Poles were familiar with and which for the Germans were a closed book. The detection of Jews in hiding occurred therefore most often on the level of so-called neighborhood watch, and therefore a great, the greatest danger to Poles who decided to help the Jews was not even from the Germans, who were far away, but from other Poles who, for various reasons, anti-Semitism, greed, uh, would report the suspects to the authorities. What makes hiding uh, the, of Jews in Poland such a deadly proposition was not even the undeniable scale of German terror, but the hostilities surrounding those who decided to help them. It's not the death penalty for helping the Jews, because that same penalty has been imposed for having a radio receiver telling jokes about the Germans, keeping unlicensed livestock, or engaging in any kind of resistance activities. And it was no deterrent. It was the lack of social acceptance for those who decided to aid the Jews which made their choice the most dangerous kind of conspiracy imaginable. In the course of years of research, I came to the conclusion that somewhere around 200,000 Polish Jews, for the most part people who decided to flee the liquidations and later hid on the Aryan side, people who had a working chance to survive, perished on the Aryan side due to direct such as murder, or indirect, such as denunciation, involvement of the Poles. My hypo hypothesis triggers furious, triggered furious reactions of the Polish authorities, for whom the defense of the so-called good name of the Polish nation trumps historical research and archival evidence. The research of Polish-Jewish relations during World War II presents a clear challenge uh, to a whole set of national myths and deeply rooted in the Polish educational system and which are at the core of the National Identity Project. Traumatized societies, such as the victims of German brutality, who now have to come to terms with the fact that some members of their national community took active part in the Holocaust, uh, provoke 
extremely hostile reactions. It is difficult, if not impossible, to reconcile this part of history with the glorious image of own heroic past. It is where historical research clashes head-on with triumphant narrative based on wishful thinking and a falsely construed raison d'état, a reason of the state. In order to domesticate the past, to transform the offending historical narrative, the authorities in Poland and elsewhere in Eastern Europe are today set out to distort the history, um, the history of, the, um, of the Shoah. Unlike Holocaust deniers of yesteryear, these engaged in Holocaust distortion do not deny the factuality of the Jewish catastrophe. What they say instead is that our people had nothing to do with it. Hence, the relentless efforts to domesticate the history of the Holocaust, to create a usable past, to quote Professor Yehuda Bauer. In the case of Poland, a relentless campaign is being pursued, trying to present the righteous, a small group of terrified people who rescued the Jews as a national default position under the occupation. Righteous are being now used in a cynical way, placed on monuments, coins, statues, streets, names and museums. All forces of the state are being deployed in order to shore up the threatened national feel-good narrative. Among all of this, what we tend to forget is that the righteous were extraordinary and unique people, badly frightened, mostly of their own neighbors, other Poles. The current attempts to distort, to undermine the historical research and record are one more reminder that, with the passing of the generation of survivors, whose voices are ever more and more faint, it is up to us, historians and other scholars, to keep the memory of the six million dead who fell victim uh, to one of the oldest messages of hate in human history, a message which has not lost much of its lethal potency. Thank you.